Brad, you're the world expert on muscle hypertrophy, and I want to understand how to best build muscle in terms of volume, relative intensity, technique, tempo, and much more. First off, if I want to maximize my muscle growth, how many sets should I be doing? So if you want to look at the literature, somewhere between 10 to 20 sets per muscle group is a good, I think, general guideline. Some people do quite well on lesser, some people need more. I think it really is more of a nuanced topic, though. One of the things that, to me, in the literature really has borne out is that specialization cycles can be very effective to bring up lagging muscle groups. And the way I look at volume is you look at the total amount of sets for all your muscle groups that, that you would do, and then you look at that as a budget. And then within that budget, you try to apportion volume so that you give more to the lagging muscle groups and less to the more well-developed muscle groups. And um, I think at a certain point, it's never been shown in the literature, but there's going to be not only diminishing returns, but you can become overtrained. If you're doing three, 400 sets, uh, obviously there's going to be a tipping point where that's going to have negative effects on you. So I think if you manage your volume in terms of the overall number of sets, overtraining, of course, is a systemic response. And you then look to uh, use volume selectively for lagging muscle groups, and those that are not, uh, you give it less, that that's the most effective way to use the volume at 10 to 20 set range. What about higher volumes? I've heard some viewers say, you know, Brad Schoenfeld is always advocating for higher volumes. Do you think going past 20 sets is better? What do you have to say to people claiming that you're this pro-volume guy? I mean, certainly I don't know where that's coming from because I have books on the topic and I've never advocated that. Uh, we published a study showing that the higher volumes can be effective, but what's really important to understand is that looked at isolated volume for a, a limited number of muscle groups. It was the total number of sets in that study that we did was 105. Mm -hmm. So 105 total sets, which would be like if you looked at all the muscle groups and, and did the number of sets per muscle group, like average it out, that would be 10 sets per muscle group. There's 10 mu major muscle groups. So it's kind of silly, but that has led to the... Um, to me, at least, the theory, the working theory, that, a, uh, that uh, specialization cycles may be effective because that's kind of what the studies are, are mm -hmm. looking at. They're looking at kind of its specialization cycles for volume. How and well, by the way, yeah. some people can do quite well with somewhat lower volume. And I should also say I do think there is at least some, uh, at least a logical basis to periodize volume where you start out with some lower volume. It's not like, this is another thing, like people talk about volume like it has to be the same across your total training life. Whereas you can look at it, and certainly the way I do, is that you have some lower volume, then you can move on to some moderate volume, and then maybe have a small cycle of, of higher volume. Let's say within that 10 to 20, you start out 10, go to 15, go to 20, something like that. You could start out at, at 7 and go to yep. 10 and then go to 13. But uh, where you're trying to push your body for a functional overreaching that will culminate in a uh, super, co super compensation of muscle tissue. Okay, and as far as counting volume goes, how would you count volume across the week? Would you only count one movement towards one muscle group? Would you consider indirect volume, like, for example, rows targeting your biceps? Mm -hmm. What's your general heuristic there for training? So the way the literature counts it is one to, or has counted it to this point is one-to-one. One. I, I think that is, um, for, for the biceps and triceps, we don't have a, an exact, but I think probably three-quarters might be a better heuristic. Um, I think when it comes to things like the hamstrings for squats, you get almost no development, so I count it zero. Mm -hmm. uh, calves, you get very little, so I think, or at least that would be the hypothesis. We don't yep. really have good data on that. Um, so again, I think really where the main uh, muscles come in are your biceps and triceps. And for those, I would generally count it more in a three quarters to one uh, ratio. Gotcha. So for compound movements, you'd potentially consider uh, synergist muscle groups like the biceps and triceps more so on a 0.75 basis or so. Somewhere in there. And for squats, I imagine it would be a similar thing for the glutes potentially or for what have you. Yeah, and that's, so that gets more nuanced because it depends upon how deep, like glutes are really not activated much in a fairly shallow squat, like mm -hmm. 90 degree. So if you're going deep, then the glutes are going to be more active. So that's where, again, trying to give heuristics on this are somewhat difficult. Yeah, for sure. Okay, so let's say you're doing 10 to 20 sets per week per muscle. Mm -hmm. How would you spread that out across the week? How often would you train each muscle group? Are there certain routines you generally recommend to maximize muscle growth? Yeah, I think that it's a great question. Um, we're starting to get more uh, 
more and more evidence in the literature on frequency uh, from frequency studies. And I think what it's coming down to is that at least at moderate volume, somewhere around 10, 12 sets uh, per muscle, really doesn't matter. One time a week is sufficient. When you're getting to more higher volumes, mm -hmm. I, I think we don't have really good literature on this, it, or at least that I have a strong confidence. So again, I think it's important to understand that evidence is on a continuum. We look at weak to, to very strong. And um, I think it's more weak to moderate here. But when you're starting to get into, let's say, if you're going to do 16 sets uh, for a given body part, I think it's better to spread that out over two sessions, eight, roughly eight sets or 10 and six or something where you're, you're distributing that volume across more sessions. So it sounds like for around every five to 10 sets you do for a muscle per week, you would add one extra day typically. That's a good general okay. rule of thumb. What about training to failure? So obviously we've covered the volume side of things, we've covered frequency now, routines as well. It sounds like generally training a muscle twice or th three times a week thereabouts is gonna be good. Um, what about training to failure? Do you think there's a benefit to be had there? Would you always train to failure? Would you keep certain sets more submaximal? What is your approach? So um, full disclosure, I come from a uh, pro school where my initial training was a go all out or go home. So every set was to failure, multiple set routines, every set to failure, using force reps, using drop sets on many of them. It's, so you're just really pushing it. And that was, that was what was taught by the mm -hmm. old school bodybuilders for the most part. And the literature has, I think, changed my opinion. I don't want to say 180, but certainly 90. That uh, I think for the majority of sets, somewhere between a two to three RIR is uh, going to get you just as good gains. I still, we don't have any evidence of this, but if you're asking my anecdotal opinion, I still do think there may be benefits for, as you get more and more advanced, to push to failure on some of the sets. And my general uh, thought is that last set to failure on some of the sets uh, may be beneficial. I also think that relegating the, uh, the failure sets to more single joint and mm -hmm. less complex moves. So when you're doing a set of squats to failure, it's going to have a much bigger taxation on your recovery than a set of, let's say, lateral raises or leg extensions. Sure. So I think if you're going to use failure, trying to manage it by using it more on your less uh, complex exercises and your single joint movements is a more effective strategy. Gotcha. So it sounds like failure isn't required for maximizing hypertrophy, but having some sets to failure might be worth doing, especially later into a session or later into an exercise, especially on single joint movements. So maybe, you know, starting at three ups in reserve on compounds and moving closer to failure, but not quite failing. And then for single joint movements, maybe around two reps in reserve on the first set, all the way to failure on the last set, roughly. And, and particularly if you are more, you know, really advanced. Yeah. So again, as you're getting to be... Uh, closer to your genetic, quote unquote, genetic ceiling so that you have less uh, margin to, yep. to grow, I think that's where this can be an overload strategy that helps to uh, potentially promote a little extra growth. Okay. I, I, and look, I'll say this, that we're talking about milking, you know, the minutia of gains that you can get. I think for the majority of people, it's not going to matter. Yeah. Okay. So you mentioned some research on training to failure, potentially not being as beneficial as you once thought in your earlier days. Um, one common criticism I hear of viewers on YouTube or people in general that are somewhat familiar with exercise science but not necessarily haven't taken part in exercise science or haven't conducted studies is, well, the participants in these studies don't actually train that hard. So maybe the research studies we have don't properly assess the effect of training to failure. What is your general response to, oh, these participants don't train hard? So I, I can tell you that... Um... We do exit interviews at the end of each study, virtually to a man or, or woman. Every subject that we have, uh, I should say every, virtually every subject that we have, says that it's the hardest they've ever trained. There are a few that certainly train, and we do oh, virtually all our studies are in trained subjects. So you could say that the majority of people don't train that hard. I, mm -hmm. I think that is true. But I can tell you that in general, I mean, I can speak for our lab, only speak for our lab, that we push the heck out of these people. We take... And by the way, we do our sets to failure, not because, as we just talked about, that it's necessary for growth, just because I believe it's a better way to standardize the training, that when you start dealing with our RIR, there is subjectivity, and you've got to acclimate them uh, to the uh, scale. So I, I just think it's easier to just push them as hard as we can. And um, look, I, I don't know. I haven't been in other labs and watched I have been in a few and watched them. And, I mean, anything that I've seen, they, they generally push. 
Could it be that there are some labs that don't push them as hard? I guess. Yep. But uh, we'll be having video from our current study, and I think that should quell any talk, certainly from, from our lab. Yeah, and certainly in this current study we're running, I can testify that I, I genuinely think 90 plus percent of participants are going to failure on every set. So uh, from first hand experience, I think most participants train pretty hard. Well, and you've been in our lab for a while now too. I mean, you've seen the, yep. so I am blinded to these studies because of the ultrasounds, but uh, you can speak to that, yep. I think very well, that from what you've told me. For sure. Everyone's training. Really hard. For sure. I just think the incentives for training hard, if anything, are stacked in favor of people training harder in studies versus the real world. Like you get yeah. paid, people shouting at you, encouragement, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, I think particularly you're dealing with young individuals and there's an ego uh, factor that yeah. you have a pre basically they're being personal trained, sometimes by yeah. more than one personal trainer. They don't want to look like they're a wuss. So, uh, Indeed. can we say wuss on this? Of course. Hey, don't worry. This is the Wolf make, Coaching just Channel. Sure. We say anything. Um, all right, next. I think one common question is obviously we have the volume side of things, we have frequency, we have how close to failure to push. But another popular topic is what exercises should you be doing? What do you look for in the best exercises for muscle building? Yeah, so I think the first thing, that, and that what is I think of paramount importance, is uh, to look at exercise selection from an applied anatomy standpoint. I think people too often just, talk, hey, this is an exercise for the chest, and they don't think about that there are different regions. Most muscles are partitioned. Mm. Uh, they have different heads, like the pecs. They have a clavicular head and a sternal head. The fibers have different directions. So there's various um, techniques that can be utilized, looking at different training angles to try to target different fibers. So I think that's very important to look at exercise selection by t uh, performing different exercises that are working muscles differentially. Uh, I know we might have some differences of opinion when it comes to exercise selection, but I think... I generally don't like to look at bad or good exercises. I think some are better under certain circumstances. And I think, in particular, different people, uh, certain exercises are better for certain people than others. I'll give you some, for instance, I think the squat can be a very effective leg exercise. For some people, I think it's a terrible exercise because they have long limbs and they just are not able to squat well. Mm -hmm. um, so, again, I think there, the nuances of the how different exercises fit the anthropometry of a, a given individual are important to consider. Um, and again, I don't know how deep you want to get into this, but I also think it's important to use uh, combinations of single and multi-joint in many cases sure. because they work the muscles differentially. I do think, and this speaks to uh, your doctoral research and your ongoing research, that it's important to try to, when possible, certainly with your two-joint muscles, to look at trying to get more lengthening, mm -hmm. uh, st stretching the muscle mm -hmm. uh, to optimize results. So like on a leg extension, your, your group just came out with a study on this to lean back in the seat so that you're able to get more of a stretch in the rec fem. I mean, these are all techniques. So I mean, this is a topic we can go on that's probably going to be way longer than you can. We can make a whole video on that. Yeah. On that note, since you mentioned the stretch, length in partials or full range of motion for hypertrophy? What is your current stance? Would you ever apply one over the other? Why? Certainly, I think the length in partials are better than short in partials. Yeah. I think that is very clear in the literature. Yeah. Does that mean that there's no benefit to the short position? I'm not necessarily going to go that far. And I'm certainly not going to go as far as to say that I think the evidence is still somewhat weak that length in partials are better than full range of motion. I, I do think there's pretty compelling evidence that full range of motion is going to get you better strength gains throughout the range of motion. Uh, and we just uh, have a study uh, with my colleague Pedrosa, mm -hmm. uh, which is going to show some pretty compelling evidence to that effect as well. What about for pure hypertrophy? Because it's mostly well, strength and hypertrophy. Or... So I'm, I'm open to the fact that length and partials alone may give you as good hypertrophy. I think there's some, the evidence seems to suggest that at this point. Mm -hmm. I'm pretty... I think that we have moderate evidence on that to say that we have good evidence. I think the evidence is still weak to say that it's better. So my general, so here's where, if you're asking me from a practical standpoint, I think the majority of sets should be taken through full ranges of motion. I think there's just a lot of benefits to that uh, from strength uh, standpoint, I think uh, functional standpoint. Um, Hypertrophy-wise, I think that uh, there's not, I don't think there's going to be much any negative, and I do think it's not an either or choice. So, this is where I'm going with that. Sure. I think if you have the majority of sets uh, to it through a full range of motion, I do think they're based on the evidence we have. I think there's enough to say that it's beneficial to add in 
some length and partials, and there's multiple ways to do that. You could sure. just do some selective sets of length and partials. Let's say do an, one or two sets. You can do, as your study uh, recently showed, that adding in length and partials, like as a finishing, an extender, set yep. extender, might be beneficial. Sure. So a lot of ways we can add that in, and I think that way you get the best of both worlds. Gotcha. Just because this is my passion project, I'm going to play devil's advocate on two counts here. Um, one, what research do you lean on when you say that a full range of motion might still have some advantages over length and partials for hypertrophy? Is that a claim you were making? Or no, 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 no. I said I don't, well, I don't know. I, I think that, number one, we don't have, we only have evidence in a limited number sure. of muscles. Yeah. So I think there's some issues with that. And single joint exercise. So, I, mm. I mean, I think that's, uh, that remains to be seen. So, uh, for sure. instance, the leg extension, we have some decent evidence in that, but we're talking about from 90 degrees to... So like 65 or something. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, uh, again, I think the... Uh, we, it's just, it's limited. So, to me, until we have a lot of studies with, that's been replicated, uh, do I think there may be benefits to partial... So, well, here, even the... I'll give you this. The study we did uh, with Pedroza, so I collaborated yep. with Pedroza, we had one group did... Uh, it was alternating length and partials and then short and partials, and that got as good or better results than just the length and partials. So could that mean that there still is something to the shortened position? In terms of hypertrophy in the leg extension study? Uh, correct. It was at least as good. I, so uh, if I remember correctly, I'll add some graphs on the screen. Mm-hmm. I think it might be better generally of length and partials only. Maybe I'm misremembering, but hey, I, I could have sworn that the uh, maybe it was the strength results I'm thinking. I think strength results, better. yes. Strength results generally combining different rep ranges. There's a few studies suggesting that, that might be better compared to just doing one range of motion. Um, but yeah, anyways, enough of a stretch for now. Yeah. So I guess kind of going in that direction, when you're coaching someone, I'm not sure if you coach too many people anymore, but when you're coaching someone for muscle building, what technical points do you usually look for? Like things that are transferable across different exercises. Like do you look for a certain tempo? Do you prescribe a certain tempo? Do you look for a certain like yeah. amount of cheating or momentum? Do you look for a certain amount of range of motion? What do you generally look for in good technique? So tempo-wise, I basically focus on a mind-muscle connection. So look, the literature tends to show somewhere between one to four seconds on the concentric, and somewhere between two to four seconds eccentric. We don't have really good Again, in my opinion, the mm-hmm. evidence is quite weak. Uh, we actually did a meta analysis on this some years ago now, and it's the one meta analysis. When I look back, I kind of regret, and I say, you know what? I don't think. I think it was somewhat premature to do the meta. That it would have sure. been better as a systematic review sure. and quantification. I don't think did justice to it. Um, and we really don't have much new evidence since then to, uh, in my opinion, to really get good insights into that. But. I would, what I would say is I think the mind-muscle connection, at least as a good logical basis, we carried out the only study to date that looked at hypertrophy on it. It had mixed results. It showed a benefit in the biceps and not in the quads. And we speculated maybe uh, some of the subjects told us they weren't getting a good mind-muscle in the quads, so could that be the issue? But I think it has a good logical rationale. And, um, and then lowering the weight under control. I don't think it's like you've got to count one, two... Uh, so that, to me, I think is the okay. most important factor in tempo. I tend to be more um, open towards somewhat loose, um, what we would call loose technique. Uh, I don't think it has to be ultra strict. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I think you need to follow basic uh, biomechanical principles. I think uh, within um, people's body types can somewhat alter their ability. You know, you look at, so you're a, big guy, I mean, you're going to have more difficulty with a squat and having what people might call pure technique in a squat. Sure. So you might do more of a squat more than you might get more uh, you know, hip extension involved. So regardless, I think that you can make as much as we don't have great evidence on it. I think we, j- just from a logical basis, you can make very good gains across a very fairly wide spectrum of techniques. As long as you're adhering to basic biomechanical principles, keeping the muscle under tension properly, Again, I think if you do focus on mind-muscle connection, that tends to keep that muscle working properly throughout. Yeah. Okay, gotcha. What about repetition range? So we've touched on a lot of the basics. Yeah. Do you think repetition range is important for hypertrophy? Do you think generally going heavier is better? What is your general stance on that? So here's a, this is a topic where I literally have changed my opinion 180 degrees. So I was uh, brought up as a young exercise science uh, professional. Uh, 
it was always taught that if you were over 12, 15 reps, you were doing glorified cardio, you're, that you weren't gonna recruit the highest threshold motor units, which are attached to the type two muscle fibers, and that you were gonna have suboptimal growth of type two fibers, which means mm -hmm. they have the largest capacity for growth and you would be having suboptimal growth. Stu Phillips, uh, one of the terrific researcher out of McMaster's 2012, published a seminal study, and there had been some evidence before that, I kind of dismissed it, but he did leg ex just leg extensions uh, in untrained subjects, and it showed exactly the same uh, growth in 30% one arm versus 80% one arm, and I went on. So 30% would be what, like almost 30% yeah, was reps, around 30, 30 reps, yeah. I think it was what they reported, yeah. somewhere in that range, mm -hmm. 30 plus reps. And eight was, uh, 80% was like eight reps yeah. or so. And I never forget, I, I went on, he posted this on Facebook, and I was, I was like, still, come on, these are untrained subjects, mm -hmm. just doing leg extensions. I'm going to carry out a study uh, and train subjects, total body routines. You'll see it's not going to be enough of a stimulus to promote growth. And yeah. I carried out that study, zero difference. difference. And there's been so many studies since then. I would say, we talk about evidence along the spectrum. We, we now have so many studies, there's just no way I could see anything changing my opinion on this. So the evidence to me is so overwhelming, you just get to a critical threshold yeah. where you just say, I, I can't see how there would ever be enough. You're just not going to see it. evidence that sure. would overturn that. And I think, so here's what I would say to that, though, because I think this is, could be somewhat nuanced. I think on a general level, five reps to 30 reps, you, you do get diminished. To a certain point, if you're doing 70 reps, we actually, I collaborated on a paper where it was 70 reps. And I think out of boredom, they were quitting way before they got to failure. And it does, important point here is that the sets are carried out in close proximity to failure. Yeah. So these are not where you're doing light loads and you're stopping 10 reps short of failure. That's clearly not going to be as effective. I do think, I think the evidence is weak on this, but I think there still is the potential that there may be a fiber type specific response. Mm -hmm. There's some logical basis to it. There is some evidence that uh, higher reps may target the type uh, one fibers and heavier reps may target the type two fibers. Sure. Whether that occurs is still unclear, but. I don't see a downside. This is where cost benefit comes in, and, and you're big on that too. Um, where if you do uh, some sets with higher reps, some sets with lower reps, it may have a synergistic effect, it may sure. not, but it's not going to have a detrimental effect. Yeah. So, as far as a, a range goes, would you say, is there a bottom end to the range and a top end of the range? Or yeah, would you kind of I, set I think, as a... So, when you start doing really low reps, three and below, you just need to make it up with more sets. Yeah. That was my dissertation research. Yeah. And I think that's ineffective on multiple levels, just time-wise, as well as it beats the crap out of you yeah. when you're doing really heavy loads with high volumes. So I think somewhere five to six on the low range and probably 30, 35 on the upper range, I don't see a benefit to going above that. And you may start seeing diminishing returns. Cool. That makes sense. Um, one further question on the topic of how long a set would last, et cetera. What about interset rest intervals. So we recently published a meta-analysis mm -hmm. on rest duration between sets. If a trainee wanted to maximize muscle building, how long would you have them rest between sets? So uh, you were on the paper with us. So uh, the study showed that, or the meta-analysis showed that somewhere around 90 seconds is sufficient. You really did not gain much extra from resting more. I think there's, again, some nuance to that. If you're asking my confidence in those results, when you try to have binary cut points, yep. you start introducing the potential for error. I, I would say that uh, generally multi-joint exercises probably need a little more rest than that, maybe around two minutes, and I think you can get away with maybe even a little less than single joint. But I, I would actually go the other way and say that I don't think you need to count rest. You don't need to sit there with a stopwatch. Mm -hmm. And I think auto-regulating rest periods is a more effective strategy. It's less burdensome, and there's actually been some research, there was one study in particular, that had groups rest either two minutes or had a self-selected rest, and they actually rested somewhat shorter and still got the same number of repetitions. So I don't think it's going to compromise gains, and I think it's less arduous. Cool, that makes sense. One area of research I think your lab at Lehman College is well known for conducting research in is training techniques. So actually, just today, we pre-printed a study on antagonist paired supersets. Mm -hmm. You've also previously conducted a meta-analysis on drop sets with Max Coleman. Mm -hmm. What is your general take on drop sets and supersets 
as training techniques, would you incorporate them for someone who's pressed for time or who wants to maximize muscle building? How would you go about that? On what yeah, exercises? Yeah. So maximizing muscle building starts to get into a somewhat murky area because like the study, we, we just dropped a superset study which showed basically very similar gains. So that mm -hmm. agonist antagonist supersets, there was virtually no difference. Very similar results with a traditional set configuration. Now, we didn't perform a lot of volume with that. So the, the total, you know, they weren't training really in the way that would be ecologically valid for most people. So we, for instance, we just did leg extensions, leg curls for the yep. lower body, which is not the way generally most people are going to train. If they started adding on a lot more different exercises and more sets, could that, Change. could there be fatigue? We don't know. Mm -hmm. Maybe, maybe not. So I'm hesitant to make a recommendation there. But I think certainly for the general public, extremely a time-efficient way to train is almost 40% less time it took to carry out the routines. Um, same with drop sets. can be a very effective time-saving uh, time strategy that does not seem to compromise gains. Uh, now, with drop sets, is a little different uh, because I think that can have potential benefit for adding volume. There really has not been good research on this. Mm -hmm. When I say good research, it's not been virtually any research. Yeah. But if you, let's say, on your last set, you do a drop set, you can basically, in very minimal extra time, add on additional volume. And we know volume is a driver of hypertrophy. Uh, so again, I think that needs to be studied. But I, I certainly hold out the possibility that is an effective uh, strategy. And without having evidence to the contrary, I think it's something that should be, can and should be experimented with. OK. Are there certain exercises you would prioritize as far as incorporating drop sets? And would you have any reservation when it comes to incorporating supersets, say, across a whole routine almost, if it allows a person to get more training volume in, in a given mm -hmm. amount of time? I think it's most effective in um, machine-type exercises where you can use a pin. Yeah. Uh, it's just very efficient. When you have to start taking plates off and stuff, it just can become more and arduous. Yeah. Uh, and it, to me, it's just I, I think the machines lend themselves to the, the selectorized machines lend themselves to that type of technique. OK. And what about supersets? Do you see some sort of constraint there as far as how often they should be implemented? Or would you see like a case for implementing them quite widely across a routine if it allows a trainee to get more volume in? Um, I, I don't think there's, certainly, you don't, if you're asking me, is there evidence, mm -hmm. uh, no. I can't speak from, uh, f from a scholarly standpoint in terms of what we, from the literature. But what I would say is, is that I, I don't, Logically, I don't think there's much of an issue with having it, um, with utilizing it frequently. Um, yeah. I don't think there's you know any logical rationale. Now, again, if you have higher volume routines, could there start to could that start to um, make change my mind? Perhaps, mm -hmm. but I think with the evidence that we have now, and just from a logical standpoint, there shouldn't be an issue. I think both of them. I don't think there should be issues. Beautiful. You just give a master class in all things hypertrophy. If people don't already follow you, where can they find you? I'd say Google me. <laughs> it's that simple. At Brad Schoenfeld, PhD on Instagram. Google him, you'll find him. Brad, it's been a pleasure. It's my pleasure. We'll see you in the next That's one. That's the man. Peace. Mm -hmm.